good to be uh, at Guilford Child Development and to see firsthand what's going on with early childhood development in North Carolina. Uh, very happy that uh, we're able to put forth a budget that concentrates on education and remembers the childhood development component part of it. So what I'll do is uh, take questions. Yes, sir, if Senator Berger's come out critical of your budget. It would seem that you two agree pretty much on the teacher pay end of it. And where is the big disagreement, would you say? I, you know, I, I think the statement came out before my, about the same time my budget did. So I look forward to uh, a thoughtful review of, of the budget. I think that there will be a lot of things that, upon which uh, Republican Senate leadership and House leadership and I can agree. I think where we're going to have uh, the biggest debate is to whether we're going to have continued tax breaks for corporations and tax cuts for the very wealthiest among us, or are we going to invest in education? And that means education across the board, from birth all the way through our great universities. It's time we do that. We've got a lot of catching up to do in that we have underfunded public education since the recession. And I'm ready to do this. Uh, it's a fiscally responsible budget. We have a budget with zero tax increases, zero fee increases, no cuts in services, and no dipping into special funds. Uh, even the last few years where they've had this budget so that they talked about the corporate tax cuts You've seen tax increases on the middle class and increases in fees. This budget doesn't do that. But instead, it's fiscally responsible and invests in people and in education. You know, the, the education budget appears to be the best area of compromise, with the possible exception of uh, they're going to want to keep those opportunity scholarships. Yes. Uh, I mean, if that's the biggest area of agreement, where do you think you're going to have the hardest time? With? Well, we want education not only to be quality education, but we want it to be accountable. I believe in making sure our public schools are accountable. We have to do assessments to make sure that students are progressing and to make sure that teachers are doing the job they're supposed to do. We've got to attract the best teachers and the best principals, and so we need to pay them appropriately. Uh, you don't have that kind of accountability with vouchers. It's going to schools where we don't know how accountable they are. And I believe our money is better invested in public education. And yes, that's going to be a point of debate and dispute. We're just going to have to work on it and work it out. With due respect, they're, they're going to say the accountability is done by the parents who send their kids, that they're the best ones to be accountable. I think you saw eight what like, Democrats came out with yesterday or the day before saying, you know, I mean, what overwhelming majority, especially of African American families, support school choice. They want these vouchers, they want these opportunities. You know, we have a lot of school choice within our public schools, and we need to make our public schools better. Uh, these vouchers often don't give kids and families enough money to choose high quality education. I think if people want to send their kids to private school, they can certainly do that. But I want to make sure that our tax money is invested in public education. We're going to continue to debate that issue. When we're talking about investment in public schools, uh, that is where our major investment should be. It's going to take a lot to get our teachers to at least the national average. My plan puts us first in the southeast in three years, and at least the national average in five years. And that's going to take a real commitment, a, tax a taxpayer investment, and I don't think we need to be continuing to increase these private school vouchers because that's going to drain money from the public schools. Governor Cooper, you plan on adding about 4,700 slots and seats to pre-K. How do you plan on doing that? Are you going to add more facilities? Um, are you going to build new schools? What do you plan on doing? We believe that if we show people that we are going to provide money for these slots, then they will become available. Uh, I think people will respond to the call. 
There are 4,700 kids on waiting lists right now. We need to eliminate that waiting list. And that's why my budget uh, makes sure that we do that. You know, we also need, I have an aspirational goal of getting North Carolina into one of the top 10 educated states in the country. Part of that formula is early childhood and pre-K. And right now we're down 20 some percent participation. We need to get it up to 55 percent. That helps us get into top 10 states in education. And that's what I want for North Carolina. It's who we are as North Carolina. How do you measure that, that top 10 state? Well, there, there are several factors. One is the high school graduation rate. Another is participation in early childhood and getting these slots filled. And affordability of higher education and making sure that we have a higher percentage of people who have education beyond high school. 95% uh, of the new jobs that were created, I believe that's approximately the figure, required more than a high school education. We need certificates, we need community college degrees, we need university degrees. So the increase in percentages of people who have education beyond high school, increase of young kids who are participating in early childhood and, and pre-K, and an increase in the number of kids who are graduating from high school, all are important factors in getting us in the top 10 educated states. Who's measuring that? Who's doing the top, top, uh, top one, top two? Yeah. Well, it, it's a compilation of, of things that we are looking at. It's something that we are measuring ourselves by. So we looked at those key components of states and looking at where the other states are in those categories, we want to get to the top ten. And that's something we think we can do. And we can get you the data. From, from our office, our budget office has it. Right, so it's not the, the, there's a recent magazine ranking of states, that's not what you're talking no, about. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Obviously, we, uh, there, there are a lot of people that look at rankings of states for different reasons. We wanted to concentrate on education, but concentrate on a measurement that understands that education is more than just K through 12 or universities, that it's a continuum and a spectrum. And if you look at our budget, we have recognized that and understood that we've got to invest all across the board. But in order to do it without raising taxes, you can't keep cutting corporate tax and you can't keep cutting taxes for the wealthy in order to be able to complete this vision. I have a two-part question about HB2, actually. Um, you've been outspoken about wanting to get HB2 repealed. What's it going to take to get it repealed? Have you thought any more about putting it on the ballot? And secondly, in the meantime, while it's still law, how much is it really impacting our state, sports, and entertainment, economy? The good thing about North Carolina is that we have a good foundation, and North Carolina has been an admired state and seen as a beacon in the South. But it's clear that House Bill 2 has stained that reputation. It's clear that it is hurting our economic recruitment. It's clear that it's keeping sporting events and some events away from our state. I've seen that even more acutely in my time as governor. I work to recruit companies to North Carolina. Some of them I'm able to bring in and they're ready to go. There are others who say, we have concerns about this House Bill too. What can you tell us that can make us feel more comfortable about coming to North Carolina. I tell them, number one, we're a great state. Number two, we're going to get House Bill 2 repealed eventually. Number three, the people of North Carolina have spoken. They've elected a, a new governor who opposes House Bill 2 rather than supports it like the, the previous governor. And a, no, a number of companies have said, okay, we'll come. We're going to oppose House Bill 2. We're going to work with you and come to North Carolina. Then there are other companies who say, that's still not good enough. You have to repeal House Bill 2. And unfortunately, we don't know who all those companies are. Because many of the Fortune 500 companies, we talk to the consultants who tell us that these companies are just taking North Carolina off the list and we don't even know about it. But I do know of some companies who are just waiting. We know the NCAA is waiting. So we need to get it repealed. 
the issue is we need to take a, an important step toward ending discrimination, but we have to have a solution that works. And we need Republican leadership to come back to the negotiating table and to continue working with us to find a compromise that works and a compromise that has the votes. House Bill 186 in its current form simply does not have the votes to pass. And they have said, no, we need to support this. No, you need to, you need to talk more to make sure we get the number of votes required for it to pass. And I'm still working. I hope we can get this done. Is there any update though on what's happening? Uh, people are still talking. They're, they're still talking. And as we have been every single day, the problem is the goalposts keep moving. And I'm beginning to wonder whether the Republican leadership really wants to repeal House Bill 2. I thought they did. They make the same accusation, Governor, that the, the Democrats keep moving the goalposts. <laughs> they passed House Bill 2 in three hours. They, they, have, they have super majorities. They can do whatever they want. They need to repeal House Bill 2. All we need is 18 House Republicans to completely repeal House Bill 2. They have to put it on the floor. If they would put it on the floor with a clean repeal, it would pass. But they won't do it because right, you start off with a, with a compromise. All right, Charlotte's going to repeal its ordinance. We're going to repeal House Bill 2. I kept up my end of the bargain. They did. Then they come in and say, well, we have problems with bathrooms. Okay then we will prevent local governments from enacting ordinances that regulate bathrooms. That's not good enough either. On and on. Now they want referendums in towns across North Carolina where you will have many House Bill 2 fights in the national spotlight. Is that going to help restore our reputation? I don't think so. Well, that's because Quality North Carolina, when I put out that email saying we are going to get the Charlotte-like ordinances throughout the state as soon as HB2 is off the books. That was their promise. But and that was why Senator Berger claimed why he said we need this six-month period to talk about But there's, about a, there's so a compromise. Right back where we there's were. a compromise that's been approved or that Democrats have reluctantly accepted, most of them, enough for it to pass, that would prevent that because they've done the statewide bathroom exemption. But then it's something else. And then you don't know what the Senate's going to do. But what you need is a solution that works. And all you need is a few Republicans who would vote for a repeal of House Bill 2. They do exist, but the Republican leadership doesn't want to compromise. They don't want to put it on the floor for a vote. And what we need to do is for people to step up, to continue to work, to continue to find a solution. All right, one more question. Um, so last year, last budget year, the state legislature passed class size reductions, uh, not to go into effect this school year, but to go into effect next school year. Um, and uh, since then, there's been some concern from some school districts about cost of it and, sure. um, you know, finding the teachers to possibly implement it. Uh, what's your guidance now uh, of what you to legislators of like what you'd like them to do? about it this this go around with the budget if we're going to put requirements on schools we have to make sure that the funding is there we also have to make sure that the teachers are there uh, i have recommended the enactment of the best and brightest scholars which provides for tuition for students in exchange for teaching in our public schools it it is like the old teaching fellows scholarship but i'm willing to work with republicans to make it work that will help us to get more teachers in the pipeline. Increased teacher salaries will help us get more teachers in the pipeline. <clears throat> then we will be able to help reduce class size. But you can't tell these local school districts to do this and that and this and that and not provide the right kind of funding. I believe in smaller class size. I think it helps educational outcomes. But I'm also ready to do what we need to do to fund public schools. Is it addressed in your budget? This no, it, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, we are ready, though, to talk about that issue as well. Thank you, everyone. Did you want to say anything, though, about Larry Hall's confirmation today? Governor? I'm not even sure what has happened. What has it's, happened? It's happened. It's happened, and it went well, is what I was told. That's all I know. Well, you know, what we need to be doing is talking about the budget and talking about repealing House Bill 2. That issue is going to be decided in the courts. 
uh, we feel strongly that that process is unconstitutional and unnecessary, and it's a sideshow that we really don't need right now. But we have a hearing next week, and so we'll have more clarity on it after next week. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.